All right, Samantha. Yes. Samantha, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Uh, I was I was born in New Mexico, but I was raised uh, right here in Los Angeles. And tell me about your family. Um, the woman who took me in, she was a high school teacher at um, Hollywood High. She didn't really have much. Um, she took you in, meaning you. Uh, she your mom lost ended. You? She ended up adopting me somehow. Um, man. Okay, my biological grandmother um, basically took me out of a drug house. I was in a drawer. I wasn't being taken care of at all. She, my biological grandmother, worked at um, CYFD in that town, so she was able to quietly and very quickly um, get me out of that house um, and get me out of that town. Um, I was taken to um, a woman and she uh, took me from El Paso Airport in Texas and took me to Los Angeles and basically raised me here. And how was your childhood with her? Um, it was rocky solely because she was a great, she, she was actually very progressive and very strong for her. She was strong-willed. Um, she's great. Uh, she was raised in a tiny town in Santo, very racial. She got out of it, came to Los Angeles, um, met a black man in the 90s that wasn't perfect. She had to cut her like she had to cut her ties with her family because she wanted to be with a black man. And um, they didn't get married for a really long time for it. I was never adopted by him because of it. Um, growing up in the 90s with that racial tension here um, made it ex extremely hard. And kids are mean. They, and they're just asking honest questions. But for somebody like me, why is this black man picking you up, you know? You're a little white girl. Um, I'm obviously not black. So it just always raised questions. People would stop us on the street all the time to make sure I was safe. Um, it, was, it was ugly going into restaurants. Oh, you look just like um, your mother. She didn't look anything like me. It was just because we were both white. Uh, so people were just ugly. Um, and it didn't help that it was a constant reminder for me that I didn't belong there. So I left home really early, really early. Uh, let me back up a little bit. When, when she got me, she took me to the hospital because my head was flat, my neck was kinked. Um, it seemed like I was pretty abused. So it is my idea that uh, my grandmother was trying to hide something um, and just kind of get me out of there. Hush, hush. My, my neck still is kinked to this day. So there was some damage that was done. Uh, the woman who got me massaged my head until it was round again. So there was a lot of trauma that happened already from, from Jump Street. Then there was this racial war that was going on kind of inside of, you know, it, 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 society and then it affects our little family that we had we didn't i didn't have any sister aunts uncles anybody to grow up with because of the this the segregation almost in yeah it, but, but it your really, adopted parents were were good you know they they did the best i went to magnet schools out here uh i went to really good schools but, but you ran away from your family early yes why'd you do that I still, I didn't feel connected there. Mm. They kind of had their own, I had a lot of problems and they didn't know how to help me too. Um, and I think I maybe did a part of that. I felt really alone Where'd with you go? them. Where'd you go? I started living on the streets uh, when I was 13 here in Los Angeles. Um, they tried to help me. They put me into a Reseda psych ward, right here, Reseda, and I AWOLed. You were into drugs? Uh, yes, I started using drugs in high school. Um, and anything, I mean, these morning glory flowers, 
that are just grow out, you just take those, boil them, drink it. Yeah, and we would just trip balls for a couple of days, 13, 14. Yeah, on the streets in Los Angeles. So um, in order to... to how, are you, kinda, how are you supporting yourself? We're stealing food, mostly. And we would all share. There was a group of... See, I was the only kid, though. I was the only kid. They were all older. I, I lied to them. I was 15 doing this. And so the state is going to let... I'm going to keep getting arrested, right, and picked up when, when you're that young. They were 18... You know, somewhere even 21, 23, you know, we're all just living on the streets together. Um, we lived in the wash in a tent. Uh, I remember we would take a, um, a cart and we would just cook food. On, we would tip the cart over and we would cook food on the cart like that. Mm-hmm. Really young. I was really young. Stealing alcohol. Um, most of those people are actually dead now. So. Where would your life go from there? Did you finish high school? Yes, actually I did. With that lifestyle? I was picked up and institutionalized for two and a half years and I was able to lose myself in school. So I did miss a lot of my high school. I was in and out of the Reseda institution. I um, took a Greyhound bus and squatted in New Mexico with a kid for about six, seven months, got arrested out there, got prop back to California because, you know, but it was, I lived a really wild, I was pretty wild when I was young. So I shaved my head in order to live in that. I stopped showering. So I was a child hobo, just as nasty as you can get. And that was the safest I could be too. So the grosser I was, the better. Um, finally I was arrested, uh, and taken to a place, um, called Provo Canyon School. And, um, the average stay there is, I believe, six to nine months. Um, I was hoping that I was going to get out eventually. They never wanted to tell me that, um, they were going to keep me there until I was 18. Um... Right when I got in, they shaved my head. Um, I, I heard about other girls getting their heads like completely shaved. I had a mohawk. So when I wore it down though, I still had hair. So I still looked like a girl with a mohawk or not. Um, all of my hair was gone. I had nothing. I just, they put you in sweats, all the same color sweats, just a sweat top, sweat, bottoms. Uh, They completely stripped me naked. Um, The people that worked here, the strangest part about this school, um, this institution, is what it was. It was a a mental health institution and um, for for kids. And uh, the strange thing is, is that the people that worked there, the staff were all fresh out of high school. They they were going to BYU. They they had little life experience. I don't know why these kids were in charge. They they were, I don't know anything and I'm 33, (laughs) you know? So I I just don't understand how 21 year olds, 20 year olds could um, help children that have been severely traumatized um, by lots of it. There there are girls there with trichotillomania, pull out all of their hair. Um, These are girls that were traumatized and needed help. Um, Therapists came in and we had groups and we had um, stuff like that, but there weren't therapists there 24 seven. There's staff, there's children you know, probably maybe going for some sort of therapeutic thing. Who knows what they were going to school for? It was probably just an easy job, you know, an inside job. I mean, get to babysit, babysit kids. But that's how they looked at it. They, they babysat us. Um, that's not what all of these kids or what the parents think 
is going on either. They think they are sending their kid to um, get help, okay? And it, it doesn't, it's, it's... So you got out of there at 18? Yeah, yeah, they made me stay there until I was 18. And they, uh, I just wanted to say this too, they tube fed me um, when I was well of weight, like probably 140. Um, to give that a, I'm about 130 right now, just to give that a, um, they would tube feed me and they would leave a tube on the side of my face and tape it and then just pour boost down it three times a day. Yeah. And the tube would just be stuck in your throat. So all day you have to gag like something's in your, so with a shaved head and a tube, uh, this place is really strange. Um, it's, it, you see it on sci-fi movies, you know, how they shape little kids and they put them in, you know, and they do s strange things to them. But, um, no, that, that really happens a lot in the state pays for it. <laughs> so when you were, when you finally got out of there, you, what'd you do with your life? Um, you're basically an adult. I am an adult. And, and uh, one of the main reasons why they took me to this place was because I didn't have a place to, I was so wild that I just lived on the streets. They had to keep me there. So because of that, right? And because I was a little, you know, I mean, he lives on the streets. I must be a little crazy, right? Um, I was still on the streets when I got <laughs> they, they didn't help me like get a place or, uh, pro they just kept me until my 18th birthday. Luckily, I graduated top of my class, um, even took a lot of courses at BYU. They were good. And I was able to just do schoolwork constantly there, really, really. That's all I did there. So I excelled in that. More of a, um, I got out, I was still homeless though. I got a van, started living in California started doing drugs. It's not like that place helped me with anything. Um, so I was still the same. I still had the same issues, the abandonment issues, the, um, the, the connection I needed as a, a familial connection I needed, um, was, was I think taken to me really by society, just how ugly society was. I think I could have maybe progressed really well with them. Um, even if they were alone with no, you know, siblings or anything. Um, I ended up, I got out in 07. Market crashed here in 08. It was ridiculous. So I decided to move to New Mexico where it was cheaper. My biological, I knew my biological family lived there. Um, and I kind of wanted to have some sort of connection and it was cheap. I was able to buy a house in Carlsbad, New Mexico for $60,000 um, when I was 19. Yeah, so moved out there. Um, found out my, my biological family is real, real messed up, real messed up. So um, I ended up on, you know, out here I was doing psychedelics, smoking a lot of weed, um, out there, it was meth. It was um, harder drugs. So, uh, man, started shooting up meth and um, my veins were gone, which happens to a lot of women. Our, our veins aren't as ropey as as you know, men veins, but we don't got, we don't have it like that. So women, I think, deteriorate a little bit faster when they start uh, using the needle than men do. Um, I was only using the needle for a few months and my veins were blown. I had to flip upside down and blow out my neck vein like that in order to hit. I am 20 years old. And um, I'm in a really, there's uh, predators. I mean, there's predators everywhere, right? But um, they especially love it when 
you're alone and you have to flip upside down and <laughs> trust somebody will hit your vein right and puts you in a really vulnerable position. So um, I was in that vulnerable position as a lot of women are. And uh, I ended up, yeah, I killed, I killed a man who um, gave me way too many drugs when I was flipped upside down took me out into a garage outside of town and um, he gave me his truck to leave. It was really strange. Um, he was high too though. I believe he had some frontal lobe damage from a motorcycle accident. Um, so he wasn't all there doing drugs with me and I wasn't all there because I was doing you know drugs with him and uh, Man, he died. He ended up dying. How did you so kill him? I stabbed him. I stabbed him in the chest one time. For what purpose? For um, a reason? Well, he asked me to, if, if you want me to be really honest. He asked me to. Um, we were fighting over his vehicle. He took me out to his garage and promised me that he had uh, water jugs out there because my water had just gotten shut off. Uh, he did not have water jugs out there. He worked for the oil field. A man started uh, banging on the garage door, saying that he needed to go to work. Thankfully, because he had a mallet in his hand. And the last thing he told me was, you are going to, you're going to need, um, you're going to need this. Or you're going to need some, like, self-defense. You're, you're going to need, um, that's what he implied to me. And uh, he kept trying to touch me. I think he thought that since he gave me dope and he gave me a lot of it that I would sleep with him. But it had the adverse effect. It was more of a super paranoid, don't touch me. Um, why did you give me so much drugs? Why are we now out in the middle of nowhere with no water? Uh, paranoia. So I can't promise that that paranoia was real. Does that make sense? And maybe that's just my own guilt. Um, but I'm pretty sure taking, you know, lying to a girl saying, giving her a lot of drugs, you know, taking her out into a garage where there's no water. And um, I ended up having to take his truck. That guy came to come get him for work. It was in the middle of the night too, so I'm assuming he worked graveyard. Yeah, it's a really strange, we're all high. So nothing kind of really makes sense. We're not doing anything logically. Why he took me out to that garage if he knew he had to go to work is weird. Then he had to give me his truck. Well, why did you do that to me? So in my mind, I'm going to hide this truck. Teach him a lesson. I'll give it back to him eventually. I don't need his truck, you know? Well, we're all high, so that was my plan. You know, we were going to get his truck back, but... Did you get caught? Did I get caught what? You murdered somebody. Mm-hmm. Oh, did yeah. you get caught? Oh, yeah. I got charged for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I told the police what happened. I said this guy gave me a lot of drugs, um, took me out in the middle of nowhere and lied to me. So I hit his truck, you know, just like a, fuck you. How dare you do that to me? What was all that about? You know? Um, and when the, you know, fight ensued, uh, he died. And he's like, stab me. You won't do it. And, you know, you stupid bitch, you won't do it. Do it. You won't fucking stab me. Well, I did. I, mean, I guess it doesn't seem very logical, you know, but I was high. Um, and I was scared. And I was just given a bunch of drugs. And this guy's angry at me now. 
I was trying to get his truck back for him, okay? He was at my house, where's my truck? I was like, all right, fine, I'll give it to you. All right, I said, hey, will you go? He didn't want me to leave. He's like, I don't want you to leave. You're gonna stay here with me until I get my truck back. We had somebody else who was very high go get the truck. How much time, so, did, you, how much time did you get? I got, um, I got, I got six years flat, two on parole. They charged me with first degree premeditated murder. Um, I fought it in trial for 18 months. Uh, they gave me a shit attorney that was dying. He died shortly after my trial, um, heart complications. So they gave me this attorney that didn't do anything, probably got paid, I'm pretty sure he got paid the same uh, regardless. Um, he didn't put on any defense, um, except that the guy that I killed was a known uh, registered uh, sex offender. He was a known pedophile in that town. He is actually known for drugging girls and doing that exact thing. So um, that was in my favor. And I was scared when it happened. Um, I was high when it happened, yeah. Nobody can, <laughs> it could have happened to anybody is what I'm saying. Any girl, high, like on this Skid Row Street right now. It could happen to any of them. And then they'll pay for it, dearly, dearly. I was in the interrogation room, um, so messed up. I was passing out on the interrogation. I couldn't even open a bottle of water because my hands were so swollen. Remember, I have no circulation, all the, all the needle use. So my hands are swollen, my feet are swollen. Um, the cop asked me if I'm okay. I said, no, <laughs> I am not okay. And uh, yeah, I was charged with first degree murder for that. Um, To top it off, when they put you in prison, they um, categorize you by charges. So if you're in there for murder, you know, then you're in there with all the other murderers. And I don't necessarily know if I really kind of fit the murder type, you know? I, I mean, I did live a really wild life, um, but not like that, not, I didn't think, um, I didn't think I was ever gonna kill anybody. Does that make sense? Um, these girls in here, absolutely. Some of them um, are insane. And uh, yeah, that's when you realize that this, the prison is just a mental health crisis. It's just a bunch of people with trauma. You know, I, I hate the, cle I hate the saying, you know, hurt people, hurt people. Uh, yes, that's exactly what happens. You don't have to hurt people if you're hurt, but um, that's the only way it happens. And yeah, a lot of, when you're thrown into um, a position where uh, you're gonna need to be in there for a while. Then you kind of switch up who you are, right? If you're gonna be put in a cage, you know, like an animal, you're probably gonna start acting and behaving um, as such. So that's what I did. That's what I did in there. I survived great, I think, but I was tattooing. I was fighting for minimal things. Um, I gouged out eyes. Um, I did horrible things in there. And horrible things were done to me as well. I got a concussion. I had to go to the medical ward for a while um, to even 
my head and my body weren't <laughs> connected, I guess you would say. I was knocked, you know, my head was knocked. So in order for me to like walk proper, I wasn't, I, you can't go back out into population if you can't walk right. So um, I turned into a complete animal. And then it makes you kind of question um, if you are that, you know? And I think I have to fight every day. Like I'm not, I'm not a monster. I don't think so. I just think I needed help. I think I needed help when I was really young and I didn't get it. When I was institutionalized three times, four times before I was 15, I was seeing all these therapists probably wrongly diagnosed, you know. It seems like this is a story that happens with so many people, but mine is just an extreme, you know, teenagers all have, you know, hormonal issues and get a little wild, but do parents, you know, send their kid off to one of these residential schools? You know, do you look into the residential school? Does it have a long history of abuse, <laughs> child abuse, you know, do they lock kids in, in uh, cement rooms with nothing, nothing. Now here's the, here's the crazy part about prison and Provo. Prison, we had beds um, in our cells when we were in trouble, um, even our dry cells. When, you know, you'd keister things, they would put you in a dry cell to force you to take stuff out of you, whatever that is. You know, me, it would mostly be motors, because uh, <laughs> I'm a tattoo artist. So it would put you in a dry cell, but you'd still have a cot and a sink and a toilet. In Provo, as, as you know, a 15-year-old girl, which there's lots of girls there, um, they have, you, it's, you're just on a nothing. They give you nothing. You're on the floor in a cement cell in there, and they'll leave you in there for hours, sometimes naked, um, forcing showers on the kids. It's, so this institution is doing this thing when I was a child, and then this institution is a totally different um, monster. It's almost like I was prepped. I was prepped, like this, <laughs> the state kind of prepped me for that, and I was just easy pickings by the time I was an adult, you know, and you're high and you're getting preyed on by a man that's twice your age who is a predator, you know, because I said the wrong thing to the cop when I was high, I got charged with first degree murder because of that. So um, I was just easily preyed on, um, I think from Jump Street, really, from birth with CPS, doing that strange adoption over state lines that makes no sense um, to institu child institutions, to prison. Kind of set you up, it seems like. It seems like everybody's kind of making money off of um, trauma. You've been out for how many years now? I've been out for Six years, four off of parole. Where is your life stand now? Do you have kids? I have a child. I have one son. You're, you're raising him? Yes. Mm -hmm. With his father. Uh, we live on the lake. Um, I live, I, I need to kind of be alone, you know? Um, so I live away from people, I, really peaceful. I don't know if that's maybe good for everybody, but it's really peaceful. And that's all I care about on the lake. Middle of Texas. <laughs> and your life is better now? No drugs? No, no. I smoke weed, you know. But no, no drugs. And looking back at this <laughs> crazy past of yours, look, looking back at your past, do you blame your parents? Do you blame the environment you were in? Your DNA? What do you, what do you? There's a lot of circumstances. I blame, oh, the nature versus nurture question. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big one with me because I wasn't raised with. Um, you know, the, the, the nature. Right. Um, I believe that the circumstances um, 
you know, adopting, adopting a kid isn't what it's cracked up to be. I don't think that's the answer um, people think it is. Adopting a potentially damaged psychologically um, or physically um, adopting, that's a big, it's a big responsibility. I don't think um, people really grasp the, the severity of, of being, um, you know, abandoned as a child. So detrimental, yeah, it's, it's seriously um, traumatizing. And I, I think it's kind of minimized maybe. I'm sure you've seen it a lot doing what you do. I'm sure half the people in here are adopted. That's but right. <laughs> it is a small percentage though at the same time. Um, so there was that. It, it, it was a, it was a, the racial, I didn't feel a part, it, it connected to a family which I probably needed desperately being. I should not have went to her. The way I was, well, I guess we could root this all to uh, CYFD corruption, really. That's where it all started. That's where my trauma started, was um, me coming out of a junkie home abused and then somehow going across state lines and getting to a woman who would... She was under the impression that I was going to... That I didn't have any other family. I have a, I have a brother. I have a whole other family um, that I just disappeared from. Uh, they had no idea what happened to me. So how I ended up with a woman who was just a teacher at Hollywood High, um, grew kind of in the slums, really. Um, remember sewer everywhere we would step on plastic lids, Tupperware lids, to walk across, and this was when I was three, four. Um, she was basically dying of melanoma cancer as well. Um, how, I was, how, the, how I was able to, not saying that she didn't do the best that she could, you see what I mean, but how I was able to um, end up with her, um, probably the first start of uh, a roller coaster events of not making much sense. <laughs> and you, you mentioned how you like to be isolated now as an adult. What, what other effects have your childhood had on you? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> I just, I like to... Coming out here, <laughs> super stressful, super stressful. There's a lot of people. Um, I am just going to say it like this. I'm, you know what, we actually all, I, I'm not gonna beat myself up over this, okay? Everybody's got a little bit of monster in them, all right? And mine comes out a little bit quicker. So I decide to isolate myself, not for, um, yes, for my sanity, but maybe for somebody else too, you know? If I'm out here and let's just say, you know, I'm not in the, the right, I'm not in the happiest mood, I'm not, you know, something's not, and I'm pushed the wrong way, I, I will uh, lash out violently. So, um, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a violent person. I'm not in prison anymore. I don't need to gouge somebody's eyes out, you know. And Samantha, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in all of this? I really just don't want to do the same thing um, to my child. Um, being isolated, not having um, family support, not having, uh, I just want, you gotta start with the children, right? That's it, really, you gotta start with the children. Cause if you, um, the only thing I've learned is yeah, taking care of,
I don't want to grow up and be an ugly person and hurt people that, you know, potentially didn't have, didn't deserve it, maybe, you know? No, nobody deserves to, to get your traumatic bullshit off your chest on somebody else. Does that make sense? You see what I mean? Um, that's the only thing I've learned, is to treat our children right. You know, listen to them. You know, because I was struggling, really, really, I was struggling as a child. I was screaming out, lashing out. I mean, gosh, I was living in a tent and I was so young. Dangerous, dangerous out here for, you know, a little girl in Los Angeles to live like that. I'm surprised I'm alive. Um, so, I'm screaming out for help. And uh, maybe the drug use. Just maybe all of all of this other self-destructive stuff is uh, that people do, um, self and and out. You know, this is outer too. You know, um, it affects every. We all affect everyone. Everything I did as a kid, everything I did as an adult. Um, at times, I feel like I yeah, I was forced to kind of turn into an animal to um, fit into that mold that I was in. Um, you don't have, you don't have to, I guess you just gotta know how to control your animal. And if you can't control it, then yeah, go live out on the lake where it's really peaceful <laughs> and you hear birds outside and, you know. All right, Samantha, thank you so much for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. Wish you the best of luck now. Thanks.